So I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, I was assigned to talk about banks, but I, I'm going to go keep going until somebody makes me shut up. Because the, uh, the larger principle, I think, applies also to taxes, health, and, and so much else. So we'll keep going uh, for a while. I would like to invite um, questions during rather than after. It's been a long day, and listening to me talk is probably going to put everyone to sleep. So uh, I'd rather talk about issues as they come up. And if I don't, I'm not going to get through the slides. So if I don't get through all the slides, so so much the worse for it. Let's just uh, let's talk about what we're going to talk about. So uh, jump in when something seems like it doesn't make any sense, which might happen sooner rather than later. Um, the uh, uniting theme I want to uh, offer is uh, from an old children's rhyme. And uh, those of you who don't know it, it goes like this. There was an old lady uh, who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed a fly. I think she'll die. Uh, and then it goes on. She swallowed a spider. And she swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. I think she'll die. She swallowed a bird. Swallowed the bird to catch the spider to catch the fly. And it goes on like this, the way you know children's rhymes do, through a dog, a, a goat, a cow. And finally, I know an old lady who swallowed a horse. She died, of course. Uh, now, that may bring you back to your childhood, or may not, depending on your child. I guess your childhood was all spent on video games. Uh, mine was done, think like that. But I do think it's a uh, useful parable for uh, economic policy in generally. Uh, and I'm going to look at banks, taxes, and health with that parable in mind. And the reason I think it's important to keep that in mind is, especially if you hang out at Hoover, you will quickly discover that there are straightforward, relatively simple, somewhat out-of-the-box answers to all of our important policy questions. Uh, they're neither parties' talking points, but, but there are answers. And then you go, well, why don't we have those answers? And you tend to go, well, people must be dumb. Well, people must be dumb is, is a catch-all theory. You can dress it up and call it behavioral economics if you want. Um, uh, but uh, I think we owe ourselves something a little deeper. And um, in each of these cases, there is a logic to it. And there's lots of things wrong with the structure of economic policy making. But there is a logic to how bank regulation, general regulation, health economics, uh, taxes, and so many other things got so wrong. And in fact, once you've swallowed the cow, each thing kind of follows from the other one naturally. You have to go back to the beginning. And what you'll see is a pattern where we did one thing, and then that had a problem, so we patch it. And then that has a problem, so we patch it again. And that has a problem, so we patch it again. And then next thing you know, you wake up and you're in the middle of Obamacare and Dodd-Frank and our ridiculous, insane tax code. And you don't know how to wait. Because the problem is, you, you, if you're just going to patch the boat, it, there's a logic to it that's kind of inescapable. You have to sink the boat and, and build a new boat. Um, but understanding the logic, I think, is very helpful for us to see that it's not so easy and to, to think about the out-of-the-box uh, solutions that actually uh, will work. And that's where our country is kind of a boat with a lot of patches on it. Um, and it's not doing real well as far as the floating uh, problem, to say nothing of the going forward problem. So I think it is a time when, when at some point we need to, as they say about America, we'll, we'll do the right thing after we've tried everything else uh, to, uh, to, to clean house and, and implement some of these sensible things. So let's, let's start with thinking about banking, which was my assigned uh, ta uh, topic. Um, and this is a similar. So, so we ate the fly in 1932. I'm going to simplify Josh's here. And he's spectacular on this stuff. So he's going to catch me. So Josh, where are you? I'm, I'm going to simplify, OK? So don't, don't object. Uh. <laughs> so in 1932, almost 100 years ago, there was a Great Depression. And there was a big uh, bank run. And that's where financial regulation, the, the, really 1907 is where things started. But I'm going to start my story in 19, uh, uh, 1932. Now, uh, by the way, I, I'm going to use some financial terminology. And if you don't know something, raise your hand and ask. I don't want to insult your intelligence, but I also don't want to lose you. So that's hard to do. But, but how do banks work is, is the first thing to think about. Well, here's the classic view of, of a bank that's, that's a balance sheet. Uh, as money flows that way. So banks, um, so they invest money, typically in reserves like cash. 
uh, securities, loans, some trading, that's where they invest their money, they have to get money. So they get money from a couple different places. Um, equity, they issue stock. They sell stock. When you sell stock, somebody gives you money. Long-term debt, they borrow money, uh, and they say, I'll pay it back in five years. And deposits, or in the modern financial system, sh various very fancy kinds of very short-term debt. So uh, how does, what's the problem with this structure? It's a classic one. Uh, I don't know if you've seen um, uh, Jimmy Stewart's Wonderful Life or the Mary Poppins. Before. I think Mary Poppins is canceled already, so that's too bad. It was a great movie. Uh, but, um, you know, those are classic movies with bank runs. Little Michael wants his tuppence. The bank won't give him his tuppence. Everybody runs to get their money out of the bank at the same time, and the bank fails. And that is the, the weakness of a bank. This, this deposit thing here is a financial contract with a strange feature. The bank promises $1 per dollar. When you invest in stocks, you're not promised, the company isn't going to promise to give you a dollar for every dollar of investment. Uh, you know, the stock price can go up and down, lose your money, gain your money. You lose money in stocks, nothing to do about it. You go home, you kick the dog, you have a whiskey, uh, you lost your money. But if, uh, if the bank, suppose the bank is losing money on its reserves, cash, and loans, and you're worried about is there going to be enough money for you, well, a deposit, it promises $1, and it promises come get your dollar anytime, and it promises first come, first serve, that's really important, uh, and, uh, but if the bank runs out of money, there's nobody left. So you can see the incentive. There's a classic problem of incentives. Economics is all about incentives. The incentive is, if you, if you hear a rumor of any trouble down at the bank, you run down and get your money out before the other guy runs out or gal to get their money. And if we all do this at the same time, the bank can blow up, even if the bank is, is, has assets and it, it was just a rumor. So we had, and worse if the bank doesn't have assets. So that's, a problem. This is an externality, if you will. This is not a, a you know, there, there are problems every now and then in economics. This, this is one of them. So we're going to do something about that. Um, now, how do, we, how do we solve that problem? Well, um, uh, in 1932, there's a couple choices, and I'll show you a better one, but we ate the fly. And the fly was simple. The government decided to guarantee deposits. So the government will say, we're, we stand ready to uh, pay off your deposits. It's my bank calling, you know. Come get your money now. Chase is on the way out. Uh, well, actually, just as an aside, what nobody is thinking right now, imagine there's a rumor that North Korea has hacked the accounts of Citibank and that who knows what's going to be left. Everyone runs to the ATM machines. So. We're, 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 our, our central banks are worried about climate change. They ought to be worried about cyber attacks. Uh, and that, that's a modern sort of thing that's going to happen here. Anyway, what are we doing in 1933? Um, uh, well, the government ate the fly. Uh, and it made what you know, seems like a reasonable thing. Let's guarantee the deposits. The government says, uh, we will come give, if you have a bank deposit, we will come, we, you can always get your money from the government if the bank runs out of money. Now, this is brilliant. Sort of. It works. Because if you know that the government always stands behind your deposits, then you have no reason to run and get yours before the other person goes and gets theirs. So that is what stops a run. And we have had bailout after bailout after bailout. The bailouts are never, they're, they're stated as bailouts of the bank. They are not. They are bailouts of the depositors, who would normally lose some money, because there isn't any money there. But the government says, we'll stand behind this bank's debts so that you guys and gals won't all come run and get it. Uh, we, we had them recently in the, in, the, in the COVID crisis. And it is, if you put me or Josh in the cat, catbird seat at the Federal Reserve and there's a crisis happening, is practically inevitable. You can be as tough as you want. That's the way you stop the crisis once it has started. Our job is to make sure it doesn't start in the first place. Anyway, that's what we did. Now. Why is that not the answer? Why is that the fly? Well, once you do that, you have a problem. Uh, if you tell banks that um, your deposits are guaranteed, if banks know that the deposits are guaranteed, uh, then they have all sorts of horrible incentives. The, the customers of the bank no longer have an incentive to make sure the bank is well run. The way banks used to work is people were pretty 
they, they were pretty choosy about which banks they put their deposits in. They wanted to know that the banks had lots of reserves and lots of securities they could sell and that the loans were safe uh, because they knew that things could come and they wouldn't have it. Well, once the government's guaranteeing it, the people giving money to the banks have no incentive whatsoever to pay any attention to how safe the bank is. The bank has another terrible incentive. It has government guaranteed uh, deposits coming in. So what do you do if you're a banker? Well, you offer a little bit higher interest rate. If Josh is offering 3%, I'll offer 5%, get a bunch of deposits, and off to Las Vegas we go, right? <laughs> because heads I win, tails the government loses. What a great idea. Well, what do we got to do? We got to eat the bird. I forgot where we were, the spider, the bird, whatever it is. Uh, the natch, you, you start patching. And the first patch is you have to regulate risks. Instead of the market discipline of depositors saying, I'm not giving you money because you're off to, your investment plan is Las Vegas or Bitcoin futures or something else I don't approve of, um, you have to have the bank regulators say you can only have certain assets just to protect the government's interest. Um, the, the fancy word is moral hazard. There's moral hazard here of providing the deposit insurance. Uh, so we unleash a wave of bank regulators to try to make the bank assets safe in place of the, the natural ma uh, market uh, discipline there. The second thing you got to do is banks can't be allowed to compete for deposits by offering higher interest rates. And that's what they did in the 1930s, called Regulation Q. Banks may not compete on interest rates. So you see right here, one of the first of many original sins in our economic policy is uh, you have to patch things by stopping competition. Uh, because if banks can compete with each other for higher rates, then that, that incentive to go to do bad things happens well. So banking became highly regulated and, and very uncompetitive. Um, and uh, so well, what happened after that? Uh, rinse and repeat. <laughs> Ever larger, larger and larger, we had more crisis after crisis, where each time some new category of thing, the, for example, savings and loans came up in the 1980s to compete with banks. They weren't really banks, so they were offer, allowed to offer higher interest rates and invest in, uh, in shoddy real estate in Texas. And then they all went under. What did the government do? Bailed out all the depositors, added another list of regulations on savings and loans. Um, we had the tequila crisis, the East Asian crisis, and of course, finally, the, the uh, mother of them all, the 2008 financial crisis, where um, this short, this deposit story applied to some very creative kinds of short-term debt applied by banks. What did the government do? Bail out the debt holders, promise, and then add one more level of risk regulation to try to keep the banks from being uh, more, uh, to being so risky. Mm -hmm.